Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHope2018.com. I want to start out with a comment that I received from a viewer here recently. He said, if I just live my life thinking that the rapture could have happened at any time, I'm much better off. That way, I'm never anxious or disappointed. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, I don't relate too well to that statement, and here's why. I believe that we can continue being watchful without being over anxious or disappointed, either one. First of all, there's nothing at all wrong with being anxious for him to return. Uh, or the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Now, I, I suppose that you could include that unless you actually believe that we uh, were not to be uh, eager for his return or anxious for his return but that's not how I view that so I don't really relate to not wanting to be anxious neither can I relate to being disappointed now and I understand that there's been a lot of disappointment but uh, we grow out of that there's no better way to be watchful every day than to be doing what we're doing and that is being watchful and sober and alert while trusting in his timing that's that's a key element to this it's very important to understand that his timing is everything. We can rest in that while at the same time being watchful and eager. Where the, the excitement and the anxiousness of it, it just dis displaces all disappointment because we're resting in his timing. So God bless you all as we uh, continue to, as we remain watchful, eager for his return and resting in his timing above all else. We're getting closer we're inching our way closer to Pentecost and you know I'm not saying the rapture is going to occur on Pentecost but I put out and I have since last basically since last October what I believe is the most likely time frame uh, for spring so we're hopeful that's what we are now I wanted to talk about our temple our temple there's a lot of talk about you know the new temple the third temple and and I just want to talk about our temple and how that this plugs into everything, both past, present, and future. Now, some of you may find this video controversial. If you do, well, uh, just welcome to BlessedHope2018.com. Reading from Wikipedia here, the Temple Institute is an organization in Israel focusing on the endeavor of establishing the Third Temple. Its long-term aims are to build the third Jewish temple on the Temple Mount, on the site currently occupied by the Dome of the Rock, and to reinstate animal sacrificial worship. It aspires to reach this goal through the study of temple construction and ritual and through the development of actual temple uh, ritual objects, garments, and building plans suitable for uh, immediate use in the event uh, conditions permit its reconstruction. Uh, many of you are aware of the fact that they've already constructed many of the the uh, what you'd call implements, the furniture, the, the furnishings for that temple. They're already constructed. In fact, they're already breeding livestock for that. And I've I've been asked over over the past couple of years, I've been asked. Well, Steve, you know, wouldn't it take a long time for the temple to be built? And I don't believe that that's the case at all either. Anyhow, according to the New Testament, the New Covenant, spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, the, the New Covenant is marked by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in you and in me, in, in the believer. Ezekiel chapter 36. The church, ever since its beginning at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, it comprises the true temple today. And this is a very key point, uh, element, that I want to begin with here. And we are members of that one temple, that singular temple. Paul illustrates this concept in his letter to the believers at Corinth, where he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. 
Christ himself claimed to be and do what the temple was and did. He is the new temple, John 2.19, and the body of Christ, that is the church. We are members of this temple, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2. The earthly temple is no longer of any spiritual significance. It isn't now, nor will it be in the New Jerusalem, because in the New Jerusalem there will be no temple, for Christ himself is the temple. Revelation 21, verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The fact of the matter is, is that Paul refers to the church as the temple of the living God, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and uh, chapter 6. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that's pneumatos in the Greek, spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Now I want to refer you back to the last earthly temple shortly before its destruction by the Romans in 70 A.D. Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise, John 2.16. Just about everyone is familiar with that verse. The word house, oikon, uh, in the Greek. The house of the father, patros, of me. There is no question but that Jesus is referring to an earthly temple in that passage. And there's no question but that the one doing the referring was in fact the true temple, even at that time. Which brings us now to John chapter 14, uh, a passage that I know many, many of you are familiar with, a passage of scripture which, which has been sorely misunderstood by many since it was written by John. John chapter 14. It begins with the all too familiar phrase, by our Lord. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. John 14, verses 1 and 2. The same phrase, house, oikon, in the Greek, of the Father, patra, patros, of me. We see the same phrase used here. But he is not speaking of an earthly temple. Christ is the temple. The Father dwells in Christ. In the New Jerusalem, there will be no temple for Christ himself is the temple, as I mentioned, Revelation 21. I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. 1 Peter 2.5 states, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, there's the word oikon again in the Greek, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Note that word acceptable, sacrifices that are acceptable to God. During the tribulation period, the sacrificial system that is reinstituted by the Jews will not be acceptable to God because Jesus was the Lamb of God who was slain. 1 Timothy 3.15, so that if I am delayed, you will know how each one must conduct himself in God's household, and the word there is oikos in the Greek, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. We are members of that one temple at the present time, which is Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And that word building is oikos in the Greek. John 14, 31 verses. 31 verses in this chapter. In, in the following chapter, John 15, there are 27 verses, totaling 58 verses. 
Now listen to me. Not one reference in these 58 verses, not one, not one reference to heaven is seen in these two chapters. Not a single one. The Greek word for heaven, you know, suranos, suranos, is just not there. Not a single reference. When there are 278 occurrences of heaven, according to Strong's. 278 occurrences of the word heaven, and you won't find one in John 14. John 12, 28 is the 17th verse where heaven is mentioned. Listen to me. John 12, 28 is the 17th verse where heaven is mentioned. It is mentioned in 17 verses from chapters 1 to 12. Chapters 1, chapter, chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 6, and 12. The next and the last mention is in John 17, 1 where Jesus says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. So it skips any mention of heaven from chapters 12 to 17. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because he is not speaking of heaven in John chapter 14 is why. But he's speaking of something else. Abiding in him as the only true source of bearing fruit. It is a setup. 14 is a setup for what he speaks about in 15, the following chapter. He the vine, we the branches. Just read it. The fact that our Lord would feel it necessary to teach his disciples regarding this subject right before he goes to the cross reveals just how important a subject he felt this was. I don't find it surprising at all. I don't believe for one second because the text gives me no reason to believe that in these final parting words of our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples that he was delivering a sermon that pertained to mansions in heaven but rather it had to do with service and ministry, life and growth, fruit bearing. That's what he was talking about. Not that he was unconcerned about their comfort and assurance of heaven. It's just that the context does not bear that out. No chapter division in the original text. John 15:1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Chapter 14 is a preface to their understanding the nature of fruit bearing, the source from which that fruit comes, which is abiding in him, which, is, which apart from him they can do nothing. Both the 14th and the 15th chapters of John reveal that the message Jesus was conveying here had to do with service and ministry rather than mansions on a hilltop. Now, I know that you, many of you will, will stay, say, Steve, you, you know, you're slaughtering a sacred cow here. I'm sorry. I can't help it. I'm telling you what the text says. I'm showing you the context the word used for abide in these passages is from minnow. The word is minnow in the Greek. To remain or abide. An abiding place, a dwelling place. It is in Christ that we remain or abide. It is in Christ, and that, that is a very, very important two-letter phrase. It is in Christ that we dwell. He is our dwelling place and will continue to be throughout all eternity. Our location will change from this place to the New Jerusalem, where that he himself, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb, is the temple of it. Which brings me to an important point. The third earthly temple, which we know will be constructed, yet defiled by the Antichrist, at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week beginning the last half of that week, known as the Great Tribulation Period. 
God will use the Antichrist to put an end, an end to what he, God himself, sees as an abomination on top of an abomination because the sacrificial system that is reinstated at that time will be an abomination to God since his son, Jesus Christ, was the Lamb of God who was slain. As a result of this action on the part of unbelieving Israel, God will allow this temple to be defiled by the Antichrist. Now back to the text in John chapters 14 and 15. Now as I read through the text, I'm going to comment as I go along. John, beginning at John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also into me. The word there is into, not in. It is not epsilon nu in the Greek. It is, it is ace. The word is ace. Believe into me. Now, I don't have time to go deep into that, but there is a difference between ace and in or epsilon nu in the Greek. There's a difference between believing in him and believing into him. They believed in him. His disciples believed in him, but they had not yet believed into him. It describes a basic, the, the word in describes a basic belief in who he is. Into describes entering into a relationship whereby we recognize Christ as the only true source of righteousness. He, the vine, we, the branches. In my Father's house, he says, are many abiding places. In my Father's house, that is, in me, are many abiding places. He was his Father's house. It is here that we make the mistake of wrongly inserting the word heaven or the idea of heaven into the passage. This phrase, in my father's house, is not synonymous with heaven. Oikos means home, household, temple. The definition of oikos or oikon is a house, the material building, a household, the family, lineage, or nation. Mark 14, 58, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. Jesus is referring to him being the house. He is not saying that in three days he will build heaven. When Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, that is, our physical body, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And that word heavens there is plural. The singular and the plural have distinct overtones and should be distinguished in translation, though unfortunately they rarely are. He's referring to our being in Christ. Eternal life is in a person, not a place. Continuing on, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That is, through the cross. I want to say this again. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That is, through the cross. He was referring to his death. It was by way of the cross that Jesus prepared the place, quote unquote, that he is about to describe. That is our position in him, the branch in the vine. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. This he did at Pentecost. We can't skip Pentecost and go to the rapture. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also, united with him, in him, baptized into Christ. And again, we feel the need to read into the text, which is eisegesis, the, the return of Jesus Christ. 
but he returned again at Pentecost. We can't say he didn't. When they were baptized into him at Pentecost, and Jesus took up residence within them at Pentecost. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. He, t he tells them that they know. And Thomas says, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Thomas's statement here clearly reveals that he was thinking physically or earthly rather than spiritually. He had no concept, and rightfully so. He had no concept of what it was going to mean to be in Christ at that time. This, what this reminds me of is their believing or hoping that he was going to deliver them from Roman occupation at that time. Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. By me. And now we see the contrast being drawn by Jesus between the physical and the spiritual, the earthly and the heavenly. He continues on and says, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. He's reminding them of the fact that his own true source of dependence is in the Father, because the Father and he are one. And it's the Father doing the works through him. I, it never ceases to amaze me, folks, how that we know that it was the Father working through Christ, and yet few today really want to talk about the fact that it is Christ living and working through us. The idea is that we, we, we tend to look at everything from a physical standpoint as if we are the one doing the producing. We are not the vine, we're the branches. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus says unto him, unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, well, there's your true ministry, folks. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Note what he says here. What is true of himself will be true of them. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. As I pointed out, he came to them again, just as he said he would do at Pentecost, as would the Holy Spirit. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. No mention of heaven. Only life in him were that they would for a time remain. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. That day, not being heaven when they die, but the day they are baptized into him at Pentecost. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. True ministry, he the vine, we the branches, as the next chapter bears out. 
And Judas said unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Still no mention of that place called heaven. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes to pass, that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the Prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me a commandment, even so I do, arise, let us go hence. Now I'm aware of the fact that it, it could be argued that chapter 14 has a double meaning or fulfillment, and that he's really just talking about mansions on a hilltop. But the overwhelming context is one of ministry, not heaven. The fact alone that Jesus never mentions heaven, when he easily could have done so, is powerfully revealing. And in the following chapter, chapter 15, Jesus launches into what to me is his best sermon on true ministry, where that he himself is the only true source of life, ministry, and service. Now look, I love thinking about heaven as much as anybody. But when it comes down to priorities, those being what lie ahead as opposed to what's important now, well, I leave that up to you to decide. We have but one, one brief opportunity in this life to see him as the vine, the only true source of righteousness in our lives and in our ministry. And when it's over, when that time is over, folks, it's over. That eternity or heaven lies before us is a matter that has been forever settled. What should really concern us now, even more so because his coming is so near, is that which concerned him. What are we going to carry over into eternity? Which is the fruit of the Spirit that will never perish. His life manifest in and through us toward others, which is our reasonable service because we are a living sacrifice, members of that one body, the temple, Jesus Christ. That was his parting words to his disciples before he gave his life for us. That is what Jesus is most concerned about when it comes to you and me. I love you all. I truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for listening.